Hello, and welcome to another teaching from 2536. Today we're going to explore what it means to be under the law versus what it means to be under grace, a debate that's been going on for millennia. But before we get started, I'd like to share some words from the Father written by the prophet Hosea, who writes, My people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priests. Because you have ignored the law of your God, I will also ignore your children. I share these words as a way to say, no matter which side of the debate you're on, you had better come to your conclusion based on your knowledge of the scriptures, and not just someone's opinion, because your position as priest, as well as the well-being of your children, depend on it. So with that in mind, we're going to start at the beginning, with the fall of man, often referred to as original sin and the consequences of that sin which followed. The consequences, or curses as a result of their sin, can be found here in Genesis 3, verses 16 through 19. And by reading through them, we can see just how much Adam and Eve's lives are going to change as a result of that poor decision not to obey the word of the Father by eating the forbidden fruit. But we also get a glimmer of hope with a hint of a remedy. It would be about 1,500 years later when the father would use Noah to preserve life and prepare the land to receive that remedy, his seed. And once the land was purified, or baptized, the father offered the remedy of the curses to Abram. Because it would be through Abram that the father would remedy the curses of original sin. The name Abram means exalted father. But later, the father would change Abram's name to Abraham, which means father of a multitude. The father would change Abram's name because it would be through Abraham that all the families of the earth would be blessed. As it would be through Abraham that all mankind would receive Emmanuel, which means God with us. The father himself tells us that those who bless Abraham will be blessed, but those who curse him, meaning those who refuse the remedy by refusing to hear and obey his voice, will be cursed. And the reason for these blessings and curses is because it would be through Abraham that the seed, meaning Christ, would come. Now let's fast forward to Exodus 19, where the mixed multitude who the Father redeemed out of Egypt are standing at the base of Mount Sinai. This is where we learn that the children of Israel have made it out of Egypt and are gathered together at Mount Sinai, where the Father shares the true message of the gospel with Moses. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be for me a treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. It's here at Mount Sinai where the Father seeks to fulfill his promise to Abraham by making this mixed multitude of people a holy nation and kingdom of priests. But like all the Father's promises, this promise is conditional. And the condition is, they must hear and obey everything he says in order for them to become his treasured possession, a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people, and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. And after doing so, the people all responded together, We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. Now I hope all this seems familiar to you, because it should. The story of the Exodus is a shadow of an even greater Exodus to come, and one that continues to this day. The children of Israel were enslaved, which kept them from being able to worship the Father, just as we're enslaved to sin, which keeps us from worshiping the Father. The children of Israel were given a message of hope through the Gospel, just as we're given a message of hope through the Gospel. Those who accepted this message applied the blood of the Lamb to the doorposts of their house. Those who accept the message today apply the blood of the true lamb to the doorposts of their heart. Then, Moses said to the Lord, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day, because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. The Father instructs Moses to consecrate the people, to baptize them, because on the third day the Father is going to come down from heaven so they could receive His Holy Spirit just as Peter instructs us to be baptized in Acts 2.38. This is then followed by one more very strange instruction. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people. And they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. The Father instructs the people not to go near their wives. 
And this is where the Father is using the physical, that which we know, to reveal the spiritual, that which we don't know. In other words, the Father is instructing those who have ears to hear not to return to all those spiritual covenants they've yoked themselves to, which are the ways of the world. And this should bring some clarity to what's written in Revelation 14. These are those who did not defile themselves with women. They didn't return to their old ways. For they remain virgins. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. In other words, they continue to hear and obey. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as firstfruits to God and the Lamb. So now the people were sanctified. They were made clean through the power of baptism. They have risen out of the water a new creation, one new man, a virgin, having put to death all their previous covenants and attachments. Now before we continue, let's take a step back to gain the proper perspective of what's really going on here at Mount Sinai and the consequences these events will have so we're able to fully understand the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. In Genesis 24 we read this, He said to the senior servant in his household, the one in charge of all that he had, Put your hand under my thigh. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I am living. But you will go to my country and to my own relatives and get a wife for my son Isaac. Then the servant asked Abraham an interesting question. The servant asked him, What if the woman is unwilling to come back with me to this land? Shall I take your son back to the country you came from? Make sure that you do not take my son back there, Abraham said. The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's household and to my native land, and who spoke to me and promised me on oath, saying, To your offspring I will give this land, and he will send his angel before you, so that you can get a wife for my son from there. If the woman is unwilling to come back with you, then you will be released from this oath of mine. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of his master Abraham and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. Now, with the understanding of this oath, let's return to Mount Sinai, where the Father has just instructed the people to consecrate themselves and not to go near their wives, meaning to return to the connections with the Canaanites. He tells them this because no connection to the ways of this world are acceptable for those who are in covenant with the Father's Son. And it's going to be on the third day that the people are going to the land, meaning to the top of the mountain, where the father would take a wife for his son. But sadly, this isn't what happened. The potential bride, Israel, was unwilling to go to the land. Now remember these words from Abraham, that the son is not permitted to go to the bride. The bride must go to the son, or the servant in charge of his household would be released from their oath. And who is the father's servant that's in charge of his household? That's right, it's Christ. So if we don't follow him to the land, meaning if we don't hear and obey the word that comes from the father, Christ is released from his oath to bear the burden of our sin, destroying any notion of universal salvation. So if we have eyes to see, we'll see the difference between the true gospel and another gospel. We'll be able to see how another gospel is really no gospel at all, because it's void of the spirit, meaning it's void of the Father's glory. We'll also be able to see how the children of Israel were powerless to uphold the law, even for 40 days, because they had to rely on their own strength and faithfulness and not on the strength and faithfulness of the Holy Spirit. This should also open our eyes to see how this is the birth of the law of sin and death, a covenant that was birthed from the whore of Babylon, and why the Father pleads with the people to come out of her. Because it was on the third day at Mount Sinai that the children of Israel took their stand against the Father by refusing to follow the Father's word, the Son, to the top of the mountain to receive Emmanuel, the law of the Spirit of life. The good news, the ten words, the seed, the Son. In other words, the Son was stood up at the altar because the people chose the Father's law in the flesh, which is another gospel, the bad news, the law of sin and death, a carnal version of the ten words. And this was a devastating blow to the oath they made, and a blow that crushed the sun. And it's this crushing of the sun that brings us back to the hand under the thigh oath. During the time of Abraham, having a son meant everything, because it would be the son who would bear the burden of the family business, carry on the family's name, and receive the inheritance. This means that the ability to procreate was of utmost importance and why a man would think long and hard before entering into the hand under the thigh oath, because entering into this oath meant placing their ability to bear fruit on the line. 
In other words, if you break the oath, your stones will be crushed, eliminating any possibility to produce seed. So just how devastating was the sin of the people on the third day at Mount Sinai? Well, let's take a look. When the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, He gave him the two tablets of the covenant law, the tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. Then the Father tells Moses to go down the mountain because the people have become corrupt. They have transgressed the covenant, breaking their oath to hear and obey everything the Father said. Now remember, if the people kept their oath, Yahweh would be their God and they would be His people. But just 40 days after ratifying the covenant from Horab with the blood of young bulls, they broke the covenant with their worship of the golden calf. It would be this transgression of the law that would cause the Father to disown the people, and they would become Moses' people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down because your people, whom you brought up out of Egypt, have become corrupt. Notice here how the Father refers to the mixed multitude now as Moses' people, because they refuse to receive Emmanuel. So Moses makes his way back down the mountain, and when he sees the golden calf and dancing, his anger burned. Moses then throws the two stone tablets of the testimony to the ground, crushing them into pieces, fulfilling the consequences of the oath, symbolizing the crushing of Emmanuel. It was so bad that the father told Moses to make an ark to carry the stones around to be a witness of the event. But there's something really interesting in the Hebrew word that was translated to the word ark. The word translated here in Exodus 25 is the Hebrew word our own. The first time we see this Hebrew word is in Genesis 50. So Joseph died at the age of 110, and after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. Notice in this case the translators translated the Hebrew word Aaron to coffin, and I think this would have been a better translation here in Exodus 25 as well. I believe Isaiah thought so as well, which is why he wrote, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Isaiah wasn't writing of that which was to come. He was writing of that which had already been. It was when the people transgressed the covenant that the stones, the word from the Father, the Son, was crushed for their iniquities. And we know this because according to Exodus 12 and Psalm 34, none of the bones of the Passover lamb are to be broken. In fact, it would be the Father himself who would protect the bones of the true Passover lamb when he was crucified in the flesh. The father instructs Moses to chisel out two stone tablets like the first, and then put them in the ark, the coffin. Yes, the covenant from Horab has the same words, but they're impotent, because they're void of the seed having come from the hand of Moses. Now they would no longer have the spirit of the father to guide them into righteousness. This would cause them to follow a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. They would create a righteousness of their own understanding, which would be done through the circumcision of their flesh in the works of the law. So the father instructs Moses to chisel out two new tablets, but these tablets would only be a copy that would come from the hand of Moses, not from the father. It would be this second set of stone tablets that would be laid to rest in the casket to remind the people of their sin. The understanding is this. When the children of Israel broke their agreement to hear and obey the father, they would no longer receive the law of the spirit of life because the father's stones were crushed because of their transgression. Instead, the children of Israel would receive the law of sin and death, but the law of sin and death was impotent when it came to fulfilling the father's promise to Abraham that all the families of the earth would be blessed. And the reason it was impotent is because it came from crushed stones, which lacked the ability to produce seed. And it's here in Exodus 24, where we read how the covenant from Horab was ratified with the blood of young bulls, which means it couldn't be the covenant of promise. Because the blood of the Father's eternal covenant of promise can only come from Christ who walked between the pieces. Only the blood of Christ can provide atonement for the transgression against the Father's eternal covenant. This is why Paul writes, The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but, and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. What I mean is this, the law, meaning the covenant from Horab, introduced 430 years later, does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. It was the law, established and ratified at Mount Horab, that was born 430 years after the Father offered His eternal promise to Abraham. And this is why Christ is the only way to the Father. 
because when Christ walked between the pieces, he did so in spirit form as a blazing torch. He became the word that is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The scriptures tell us that the law from the Father's voice are the ten words, and when we receive the law from the Father's voice, it comes with the spirit of truth. These are the commandments the Lord proclaimed in a loud voice to your whole assembly there on the mountain from out of the fire, the cloud, and the deep darkness, and he added nothing more. Then he wrote them on two tablets and gave them to Moses. In other words, what flows from the voice of the Father is the law of the Spirit of life, the good news spoken, the gospel, the seed, and the Son. It would be 430 years after the Father established his covenant with Abraham that he makes the same offer to the children of Israel. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, in other words, if you hear and obey the law of the Spirit of life, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession, although the whole earth is mine. Of course, the people quickly agree to the Father's terms, but it would be just three days later, when they were tested, that they would break their promise. It was on the third day that the children of Israel rejected the Father's offer of Emmanuel and demanded he change his eternal covenant. And as often the case, the Father gave the people the desire of their heart, just not in the way they were expecting. And this is the how and why the blood of bulls and goats came to pass. But as we learn from Isaiah, this was something the Father never really wanted. Since the Father couldn't change the terms of his eternal covenant, he gave the children of Israel the law without the Spirit, which Paul refers to as the law of sin and death, which would be powerless in fulfilling the Father's promise to Abraham that all the families of the earth would be blessed. And it was just 40 days later that they broke their promise to keep that law too, with their worship of a golden calf. In other words, it was at Mount Sinai on the third day that the Father offered the children of Israel his law, the law of the Spirit of life. But they rejected it, and in doing so, they were rejecting him. This was their sin. This was their transgression of the law, their rejection of the law of the Spirit of life. So if you were born the normal and natural way, or as Paul puts it, born according to the flesh, then you're birthed in sin, born to a covenant that contains a version of the law that's void of the Spirit, and why Paul calls it the law of sin and death. This means that all of mankind is born to the slave woman and are slaves to sin, and born under a covenant that is void of the Spirit of life, which is the law of sin and death. When the law of sin and death was nailed to the cross, we became lawless because the law of sin and death is dead. Thus, those who remain in this covenant are practicing lawlessness. Which is why Christ tells us that we must be born again. We must be born of the Spirit by entering into the covenant of promise. With their worship of the golden calf, the Father desires to annihilate them all and start over with Moses. Even with Moses pleading with the Father on their behalf, the Father makes an oath against Israel, which we know as the curse of the law. The Father replied to Moses, Whomever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Then the children of Israel received the bad news that they would no longer have a manual, as the Father tells them he would no longer go with them. This is when they're told to remove their wedding garments, because they would no longer be in the Father's grace, having been separated from his spirit. This would be the penalty for their breaking of the hand under the thigh oath. They would have the stones that lack the ability to produce the seed because the stones have been crushed. This is when all the Father's goodness passed by them, as they stood in the cleft of the rock. When all the Father's glory passed by Moses, he was representing Israel, who was still in the darkness of the cleft of the rock, symbolizing that they remained in her, the slave woman. And since the people were unable to see all the Father's glory, they remained in their spiritual covenant with death. So the question is, when would the Father forgive them for their transgression of the law? When would Israel become a holy nation and kingdom of priests? Moses isn't told when Israel would return to the Father's grace, but he was given hope as the Father makes a promise that one day Emmanuel would once again be offered. Because then the Father says, I am making a covenant with you, which would be a new covenant. Before all your people I will do wonders never done in any nation in all the world. The people you live among will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. So let's not miss this. The Father says he's going to do wonders never done before in any nation, and how this work will be so awesome those living among them will notice. So what is this wondrous and awesome work 
since the Father does nothing without revealing it to his prophets. Let's see what Ezekiel has to say. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and to be careful to keep my laws. And this is why Christ came, to offer a pardon for sin and iniquity, a way to be released from the law of sin and death by offering the Father's Spirit to all who believe. Following their transgressions in the first 40 days at Mount Sinai, the Father withdrew his offer for them to receive Emmanuel. No longer would Israel be a kingdom of priests who would go into all the world preaching the gospel. Instead, the Father took an oath against Israel, known as the curse of the law. However, for the sake of his promise to Abraham, the Father doesn't annihilate the children of Israel. Instead, he gives them a temporary covenant, where their sin would be covered by the blood of bulls and goats. Then, 40 years later, Moses would write the Book of the Law, which would also be known as the Covenant from Moab. This covenant contains the terms and conditions having to do with the curse. For those who are under the jurisdiction of the Book of the Law of Moses, or as Paul puts it simply, those who are under the law, if you break even one of these laws, you're cursed, because there will be no mercy or forgiveness. This is what Paul is referring to in chapter 3 of his letter to the Galatians. So let's explore this in a little more detail. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Now we don't need to guess what the works of the law are. As Paul tells us, it's performing what is written in the book of the law of Moses. Paul goes on to write that no one will be justified or declared righteous by performing what's written in the book of the law of Moses as the righteous will live by faith. The law, meaning the book of the law of Moses, is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says, the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Then Paul explains why this happened. He redeemed us in order that the blessings given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles, meaning all the families of the earth through Christ Jesus, who is the word that comes from the voice of the Father, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit, the Spirit who gives life, Emmanuel, God with us. And in Paul's letter to the Romans, we learn why. For what the law, the law of sin and death, the covenant from Horab, was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering, for the transgression of the law of the spirit of life. And so he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And what is the righteous requirement of the law? It's death, for the wages of sin is death. Christ fulfilled the righteous requirement of death on our behalf. This is why in his Sermon on the Mount, Christ told the people, he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it which is what he did when he fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law, which is death, on our behalf, on the cross. Paul goes on to write, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, the law of the Spirit of life, to hear and obey the voice of the Father, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness because the death penalty has been satisfied to declare a man righteous before the Father. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not of the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die in order to comply with the terms and conditions written in the book of the law of Moses. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. 
The spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory, which is through the circumcision of the heart, not the circumcision of the flesh. So those who choose life by accepting the gospel message contained in the book of the law of Moses have been released from the law of sin and death by entering into the law of the spirit of life. And these two laws or covenants are administered completely different. And since no one can serve two masters, we must decide on whom we will serve. Will we serve Moses, who is the mediator of the book of the law covenant and the law of sin and death? Or will we serve Christ, who is the mediator of a new covenant, the restored covenant of promise, by hearing and obeying the voice of the Father through faith? Yes, we enter into the covenant of promise with simple acceptance of the gospel message. But like the children of Israel, if we break our vow to hear and obey because we're unwilling to put our faith in the Father's word, then we too will be broken off because of our unbelief. Now we started this teaching with a rebuke from Hosea and how because they ignored the law, the Father rejected them as priests. Now we can see that this wasn't something that was going to happen, but something that has already happened. It happened when the children of Israel rejected the law of the spirit of life and then exchanged it for something disgraceful, the law of sin and death. So what about you? Have you exchanged the law of the spirit of life for something disgraceful, like the doctrines of men? Well, we hope this teaching has blessed you and you found it helpful in acquiring the education Peter warns is necessary in order to better understand the scriptures and especially Paul's writings. Thank you and may you be blessed in your pursuit of truth. Shalom.